American. Mm, not quite the way I thought. Not sure how to go bigger. Maybe like this. That will help. There we go. All right. So uh, good morning, everyone. Today we're continuing our series called No Contradiction, and we are on part six already. We've done five parts before. Um, there are no contradictions in God's word, but there are some errors in translation, some misunderstandings, and especially taking things out of context. And today, we're, we're finally, after five parts, we're going to start in one of Paul's letters. We're going to be looking at the book of Romans. And uh, we're going to cover the first three chapters. Imagine, there's so much stuff. I'm going to be reading almost the whole three chapters and going through it all so uh, that we don't miss anything and we address every, every misunderstanding. Amen? But before we start, we're going to do a quick recap of what we saw in the first five parts of the series. Note, if you have not seen uh, the first five parts and you have questions about anything in these recap slides, I encourage you to go on our YouTube channel and to watch the previous teachings of the series. Because you know what? They were on purpose. They're all building blocks. We're going to get into Romans and mention some things and you won't understand unless you've seen some of those previous parts. So I encourage you to do that. So in part one, we saw that all, not all scriptures are equal. And to properly interpret a letter, we need the three W. We need to understand who wrote the letter and what they believed, what they stood for. We need to understand also who the letter was addressed to and what they were going through at that time. That's the third W, the context. What were they actually talking about? Because if we don't get that, we only get half of the story. And you know, twisting Paul's letters to justify not keeping the Torah, it leads to destruction. So we saw that in part one. And then in part two, we saw that, you know what? Yeshua did not abolish the Torah. And he did not come to start a new religion. And we uh, spent most of that part looking at Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10, where the sheep comes down and there's wild animals and God says, go kill and eat. And we saw that, you know, it actually had absolutely nothing to do about food, but it was about Gentiles. And uh, Peter's vision was about Gentiles uh, being not unclean. In part three, we looked at the Jerusalem debate. And we saw that, you know, we are saved by grace through faith. And I spent a lot of time explaining that faith is not the same thing as believing. And that faith is obedience to God's word. And without works, faith is dead. And it is impossible to please God without faith. So that was part three. Part four, we looked at who is Paul? Because as I said, you need to understand who the author is in order to understand a letter. And we saw what he stood for. And Paul, he imitated Yeshua and he kept the Torah. And, you know, we concluded at the end of that part four, that it's impossible that Paul kept the Torah and yet taught that it had been abolished, you know? So that was part four. And part five that we looked at uh, about four weeks ago was uh, specifically about Romans 6, 14. Uh, the verse that says that we are no longer under the law, but under grace. And we spent the whole time looking at that verse and understanding what he was actually talking about. And we came to realize that Romans 6, 14 is not about not being under the law of God. 
but that we are no longer under the law of sin and death. If we have been saved by grace through faith, you know, the goal of this series is to call the followers of Messiah back to the whole word of God. This is what I believe the ministry of Yeshua was before the cross. That's what it was all about. And I believe that Paul also tried to walk as Yeshua walked. And that the same message as Yeshua taught, he also taught. And so we're going to be demonstrating that in this part. And uh, we're going to, um, it's, not, it's not by accident that we're starting with Paul's letter to Romans as the first letter to address in our series. This letter is foundational, especially how in it Paul reveals his understanding of the Torah and how it relates to us in the faith. But first, you know, I mentioned who Paul was. I need to say just a little bit about who this letter is going to, to the Romans, okay? That's one of the three W's. And this letter was not just going to uh, Italian people, Gentiles that lived in Italy. It was going to the lost sheep of Israel. And we have a whole study on this uh, that we've done in the past. So I won't go too much in length, but the lost sheep of Israel was the Northern kingdom that got dispersed amongst the nations. And some of them now live in Rome. So it was addressed to them as well as it was addressed to Gentiles. And these Gentiles, they're different than the lost sheep of Israel, but this letter was addressed to them also as well as was addressed to some Jews because in Rome there were Jews there also and so we're gonna we need to understand that because otherwise it will make your understanding of what we're going to read more difficult so there's a, a a whole diversity of people this letter is addressed to that live in Rome so are we ready we're going to start with Romans chapter one Let's go. So uh, Paul starts. Oh, somebody needs to mute their microphone. There. Paul starts off Romans by stating that grace is designed to bring about the obedience of faith. Let's read it together. In Romans 1, 1 to 6, it says, Paul a slave of Messiah Yeshua, called to be an emissary or an apostle and set apart for the good news of God, which he announced beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now concerning his son, he came into being from the seed of David, according to the flesh. He was appointed son of God in power, according to the Holy Spirit by the resurrection from the dead. He is Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. And through him, we have received grace and the office of apostleship or emissary to bring about obedience of faith among all the nations on behalf of his name. And you also are called to Messiah Yeshua. So Paul starts by saying that Yeshua, our Messiah, was always the plan in the scriptures to provide the means to grace. And that the Messiah was also there to teach or really to reteach us that the word of God. He was teaching us that as disciples of the faith, that it yields our obedience. Now, our faith in the word of God, thus the obedience we are called to, is the word of God. Note that in Paul's introduction, he clearly states that in our faith, we are to be obedient. Also, note that this obedience 
does not replace grace, but it is grace that gives us the desire to be obedient to the faith. And why are we obedient? We are obedient for the sake of his name among all the nations. When we come to the faith, we also come into his grace. Then we also follow the word of God in the faith, which is called obedience. Do you see the order there? Faith and grace is not the result of obedience, but obedience is the observable result of true faith and grace. We talked a lot about this. I believe it was in part four. And this brings glory to our creator's name because, you know, it's his name that we follow and that becomes a banner to the nations. We do this by obeying his word and proclaiming it as truth. It is a proclamation of the authority we claim in our lives to do his will instead of our own will, which is the will of the flesh. The Hebrew word name is Shem. And the word Shem, it denotes the character or the authority. Remember, we looked at this when we looked at the third commandment, to not take God's name in vain. We talked about this. And thus the goal of our creator is for the whole world to obey his ways and to follow in his character, to emulate in his Torah by his authority. So you see right in the first paragraph here in Romans, we see Paul, he's appealing to the mission of calling all nations into the obedience of the word of God. So basically, Paul starts off his letter by touching on what is usually called the Great Commission, where Yeshua instructed his disciples to teach all the nations to do what? To obey everything he had commanded. Look at Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Yeshua said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Some people never read that last part. They stop after the baptizing part. But it was all about making disciples and teaching them to observe what? To observe his word. Of course, our Messiah only practiced and taught the word of God, which is the Torah. And Yeshua was the word, the Torah made flesh. So moving on to verse 8 in Romans, let's read 8 to 17. Okay? So first, I thank my God through Messiah Yeshua for all of you because your faithfulness is made known throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the good news of his son. How unceasingly I make mention of you, always pleading in my prayers, if somehow by God's will, now at last I will be granted a good journey to come to you. For I long to see you, so I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is to say, we would be encouraged together by one another's faithfulness, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that many times I plan to come to you so I might have some fruit among you also just as I have among the rest of the nations. I have a no obligation to both Greeks and barbarians, to both the wise and the foolish. So I am eager to proclaim the good news. Also to you who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the good news. 
for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who trusts, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, remember what we discussed in part three about obedience of the faith? He uses the word righteousness here, and it's related to faith, and then quotes the prophet Habakkuk. That, that last quote there, the righteous shall live by faith, comes from Habakkuk 2, verse 4. So here Paul reveals that the righteousness of God is revealed by our faith, and it also brings others to the faith. So according to Paul and to Habakkuk, faith is a way of life. Faith is not a philosophy or simply a belief. Instead, it is absolute truth that becomes our way of life. You know, if it is truth that rules over us, in our mind and in our actions. We do what we believe to be true. In other words, if the word of God is truth to you, then it is the word of God that you will do. That is the righteousness that is the faith we live by. When we examine what the word righteousness is in a, in a biblical concordance, we will find that righteousness simply means walking in the right ways of God. And these right ways, they're not subjective and they're not made up by anyone like you or I. The right ways are the ways written in the word of God and more specifically in his Torah. Now, this is very, very important. We are only in chapter one. But this definition of righteousness that Paul establishes here will present itself again in chapter 10. So please remember how Paul defines righteousness. And living by faith means keeping the Torah. So then, after Paul um, defines righteousness, I'd not sweet. Just a second. So after Paul defines righteousness and faith as the right way to live, Paul then describes the opposite, which are the unrighteous ways to live. Now remember, Paul is addressing Rome, which has become accustomed to all types of unbiblical behavior that our Creator detests. He also begins to detail some of the typical Roman traits in an attempt to illustrate what unrighteousness looks like. This is contrasted against the righteous who live by faith and who walk in the whole word of God. Let's read Romans 18 all the way to 32. Okay, so it's 15 verses. Let's look at that. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. In unrighteousness, they suppress the truth because what can be known about God is plain to them. For God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen ever since the creation of the world being understood through the things that have been made, that have been created by God. So people are without excuse, for even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks. Instead, their thinking became futile and their senseless hearts were made dark. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. So, Paul is contrasting here righteousness with unrighteousness. And there are those in the faith called to obedience, and there are those 
not in the faith that do unrighteousness, contrary to the truth. And we know from Psalm 119 that God's Torah is truth. So let's continue. Verse 23, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for an image in the form of mortal man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them over in the evil desires of their heart to impurity, to dishonor their bodies with one another. They traded the truth of God, which we said was the Torah, for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creation rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to shameful passions. Even their women exchanged natural relations for what is against nature. Likewise, the men abandoned natural relations with women and were burning with passion towards one another. Men committing shameful acts with other men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And just as they did not see fit to recognize God, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what is not fitting. They became filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. They are foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree and those who practice such things deserve death, they not only do them, but they also approve of others who practice the same. Wow. Paul just went on quite an impressive rant here, these last 15 verses, offering us a bunch of examples on defining unrighteousness. Note how earlier Paul defined righteousness as a way of living, a way of doing the right ways. Likewise, Paul just defined unrighteousness. It's breaking the Torah or as living contrary to the word of God. In the last verse here we read, Paul declares that there are those that know the righteous ways, yet practice ways contrary to God's Torah. In addition, they allow others who may not know or have the law to continue being lawless. So some know the truth, the Torah, and don't keep it. And some, like Gentiles, don't know about God's Torah, so they don't keep it. And Paul then shares that for both groups, the wrath is coming. Look at Romans 2, verse 12 and 13. For all who have sinned outside of Torah, will also perish outside of Torah. And all who have sinned according to the Torah will be judged by the Torah. For it is not the hearers of Torah who are righteous before God, rather it is the doers of the Torah who will be justified. Did you catch that? Though we are saved by grace, it is the doers of the law who will be justified and will be righteous before God. Not because of their works or because they have kept or keep the law of God perfectly. Let's make that clear. But because they believe and they've put their faith in the word of God. They believe that to be truth. And thus they want to do all of the Torah, all of the law of God. If you believe this is a conflict between works and grace, or that doing the law of God negates grace, 
then you've just misunderstood what I just said. That's not at all what I'm saying. Now, how is it fair that those that do not have the law, the Torah, the Gentiles, how can they be judged by the law of God? Paul explains how all men, they know that from their basic principles written by nature in our hearts, that it reveals the nature of God and how we have all lived contrary to them. Look at verse 14 to 16. For when Gentiles who are not, something smells like it's heating up. No? Is the heat on? Sorry, everyone. Um, for when Gentiles who do not have the Torah do by nature the things of the Torah, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the Torah. They show that the work of the Torah is written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts switching because between accusing or defending them on the day when God is judges the secrets of men according to my good news through Messiah Yeshua. So after talking about Gentiles that do not have the Torah, Paul goes back to those who have the Torah, but do not obey it. This would be the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Remember what Yeshua said about how the Pharisees treated the law of God? Look at Mark 7, 6 to 8. And Yeshua said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Having left behind the commandments of God, you hold on to the traditions of men. And in John 7, 19, again, Yeshua said, Hasn't Moses given you the Torah? Yet none of you keeps it. So just as the Pharisees and the Sadducees made every attempt to cause issues for Yeshua, they continued doing the same for Paul and the Gentiles coming into the faith. Look at Romans 2, 17 to 20. But if you call yourself Jewish, so Paul's referring to the Jews here, and you rely upon the Torah, and you boast in God and know his will and determine what matters because you are instructed from the Torah and you are sure that you are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the Torah the embodiment of knowledge and the truth. So, in talking to these types of Jews, no Paul's references of the law being God's will, being what is excellent, and as knowledge and as truth. Continuing in verse 21 to 24, you then who teach others, talking to, still to these Jewish people, do you not teach yourself? You who preach not to steal, do you steal? You who say not to commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob temples? You who take pride in the Torah, through your violation of the Torah, do you dishonor God? For it is written, the name Shem of God 
is slandered among the nations because of you. Note here in verse 23, Paul states that breaking the law of God dishonors God. Paul here is speaking to Jews, those who teach others. Also note that because the Jews were doing this, that it blasphemes the law of God to the Gentiles. Meaning what? The law of God was also intended for the Gentiles. But the Gentiles were not getting it because the Jews were perverting its purpose and how to practice it. Paul knows that the Gentile converts will be hearing Torah every Shabbat. And he knows that the teachers of the law will be helping the converts understanding it and practicing righteousness. So Paul is telling those who understand the law, the Torah, and teach it that they need to exercise impeccable behavior to be good example, being careful to do what they are teaching. Then Paul begins to talk about circumcision. Starting verse 25 in chapter 2. Let's read. Circumcision is indeed worthwhile if you keep the Torah, but if you break the Torah, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcised keeps the righteous decrees of the Torah, which includes circumcision, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Indeed, the one not circumcised physically who fulfills the Torah will judge you who even with the written code and circumcision, you break the Torah. For one is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision something visible in the flesh. Rather, the Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is of the heart in spirit, not in letter. His praise is not from men, but from God. Now, many have taken this section to mean that Paul believes that circumcision is now only of the heart and no longer physical. However, did you know that circumcision has always been about the heart as well? Paul is not teaching anything new here. Spiritual circumcision does not nor has ever replaced physical circumcision. In fact, it is quite the opposite. A circumcised heart has always meant a heart that is willing and desires to follow the Torah. And a circumcised heart is the desire for obedience to the faith. Physical circumcision is an outward sign of an inward circumcision. Let me explain. Like Yeshua, Paul is only teaching what is in the Torah, nothing new. He cannot add or take away anything from the Torah. Remember Deuteronomy 4.2? So how can he be adding this brand new thing called circumcision of the heart? He's not, because it's actually circumcision of the heart is found in the Torah. Look in Deuteronomy 10, 16. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. You know, God told Israel to circumcise their heart because there were some that were stubborn and stiff-necked, refusing to follow and to walk in his Torah. They did not love God. Their heart was hardened and needed to be circumcised. Remember that by keeping God's commandments is how we show him that we love him. Look in 1 John 5 verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. You want to show him that you love him? Keep his commandments. And you know, circumcision of the heart 
has always been a commandment and delivered to us in the same package as physical circumcision. Look in Deuteronomy again, chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. You're going to circumcise your heart so that you will want to keep his Torah. You're going to want to keep his commandments, which include circumcision. So let's go back to Romans 2.25 that we just read. And notice the very first verse. Circumcision is indeed worthwhile if you keep the Torah. Paul says, for indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law. So circumcision is profitable, but only if you're keeping the Torah. This makes sense. Why? Because circumcision is to represent your desire to want to keep the Torah. One of the big issues with new believers in the first century was about when a convert should be circumcised in the flesh. You remember that Jerusalem debate? Because circumcision in the flesh is the seal of the faith of Abraham. Now, since converts are also descendants of Abraham by faith, eventually they should have this seal of righteousness too. As we saw from the Jerusalem Council in part three, the converts were to listen to the Torah every Shabbat in synagogues. And as the teachers of the law helped instruct them, the converts would learn and they'd want to have the circumcision that Abraham had in the faith. Somebody needs to mute their microphone. Somebody just joined us. Paul did not say that outward circumcision doesn't matter. For that would not go against scripture. Since outward circumcision is an everlasting command in the Torah. Right? He can't go against because that would be sin. And he never taught against such a thing. Look in Genesis 17, 13 to 14 in the Torah. So my covenant will be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But having a circumcised heart and the gift of the spirit will help us want to zealously keep the Torah. The teachers of the law don't need to worry about physical circumcision. Right away, the new converts with circumcised hearts and the spirit will eventually want to be physically circumcised as they grow in the faith. Like Abraham, the converts can have faith while uncircumcised in the flesh. And like Abraham, because of their faith, they will receive the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which they had while uncircumcised. Note. Just like it is for the Jew, if a convert is circumcised but does not keep Torah, then that outward circumcision, it won't save him. Circumcision only profits if we keep the Torah. For the uncircumcised converts to keep what has been established in the Torah, it demonstrates their circumcised heart. As adult converts, obedience and knowledge of God should precede the act of outward circumcision. Like Abraham, the converts will be credited righteousness before being circumcised because they will have faith, faith like Abraham did, to observe all that Yahweh commanded. After all, God said he chose Abraham. <laughs> 
because Abraham obeyed him and kept his charge, his commandments, his statutes, and his laws. Amen. The point of all this is that our faith is to transform us from the inside out, not from the outside in. First, we need the spirit and the desire in us to follow the Torah or the whole word of God. Only after that and through continued hearing and learning about the word of God will we practice the rest of the Torah. Thus, it makes no sense to pressure anyone to get circumcised as they who are circumcised of the heart will eventually understand it in their studies that circumcision of the flesh is part of the Torah. It is part of being obedient in faith. The obedience to circumcision will happen when it is ready to happen in a person's faith, just like it was with Abraham. Look at James 2. He talks about this. You see that faith worked together with his works and by the works, his faith was made complete. The scripture was fulfilled that says, and Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a man is proved righteous by works and not by faith alone. And we talked at length about this in part three. If you have questions about that, please look at part three again. So now we can proceed to chapter three, the last chapter we're going to look at today. And Paul reiterates here the value of circumcision to those who may not have well understood what we just saw in chapter two. Let's read it together. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? It's much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles or the Torah of God. So to quell any confusion, Paul clearly states here that circumcision has much value. If anyone perceived his earlier statement about focusing on circumcision of the heart first, as though circumcision of the flesh had no value, Paul right away clarifies that in chapter 3, to state that not only does circumcision have, of the flesh still have value, as it is part of the Torah, but the whole Torah, or the oracles of God, are still of value. And to have the whole Torah and to know the whole Torah and to practice the whole Torah is an advantage that the Gentiles did not have as they still had to learn it. Again, knowing and practicing the whole Torah is an advantage, not a disadvantage or something that is bad. He basically states that the Jews who were entrusted with the Torah, the oracles of God, which is the um, because the Jews were entrusted with the Torah, their circumcision was occurring on the eighth day after being born. And this is unlike the Gentiles who were being circumcised like Abraham when they were adults. This is simply to point out Paul's earlier point. The Jews cannot expect the Gentiles to catch up to full understanding and obedience to the word of God immediately. It takes time to study, to learn these things. The Jews had been raised in the Torah their whole life. The Gentiles have not. That difference needs to be respected and appreciated. We see the same issue presenting itself in Acts 15. You remember the Jerusalem debate? Throughout all of Paul's letters, we see the same common thread of issues 
and context presenting themselves. So moving on here, Paul then makes the case that men are sinful. We're going to read Romans 3, 3 to 8. So what if some did not trust? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? May it never be. Let God be true, even if every man is a liar, as it is written, that you may be righteous in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? God is not righteous to inflict wrath, is he? May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if by my lie, the truth of God abounds to his glory, why am I still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil so that good may come? Just as we are being slandered, and as some claim that we say, their condemnation is deserved. So, no man here are inherently evil. Our creator is perfect and faithful. Though we sin, it does not take away from the faithfulness of our creator. When we sin, we show that God is good. Our unrighteousness makes it even clearer and more obvious just how righteous God is in his character. Paul argues here that some might say that God is bad because his righteousness is revealed through our unrighteousness and that God still judges us for our unrighteousness. Some might say that since it is good that our sin shows the perfection of our creator that is good, then why don't we sin all the time? And if our unrighteousness is good by showing God's righteousness, then why would God condemn us for our unrighteousness? It seems like a confusing argument. So Paul makes a distinction. Says, when our unrighteousness is revealed to us as compared to God's righteousness, we should then desire the righteousness of God, which is his perfect Torah. Let's continue at verse 9. We'll read 9 to 20. Then what? Are we better than they? No, not at all. For we have already made the case that all, both Jewish and Greek people, are under sin. As it, as it is written, there is no one righteous. No, not one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks after God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. There is no one who does good. No, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of vipers is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths, and the way of shalom they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Notice that, no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So Paul here says that those that do not seek God have no fear of God in their eyes. Those are the unrighteous. Those are the people that are under the law, according to Paul. They will be accountable to God and their mouth will have no defense when they are judged. 
These are not the people who desire to follow after the law of God. In fact, they are the exact opposite. These are the ones who are under the law of God. Now, sometimes people confuse it by thinking that those who follow the Torah are the ones that are under the law of God. But remember what we saw in part five? Being under the law does not equate to whether or not we should follow the law of God. Being under the law equates to those that have sinned and are deserving death and are thus under the law of sin and death. And if you don't get that, please go back and look at part five. That was very well explained. So if you recall, Paul discusses in part five, several laws. And in his teaching, um, in fact, he makes mention of seven of them. And we saw these in, in part five. I'm just going to go do a quick recap for you. If you've forgotten. So these seven laws that Paul is talking about, through them, he's trying to teach the process of faith and salvation, as we saw in part five. Okay, so first, there's the law of God. We know that. That's the Torah. Okay, and that defines what sin is and what sin is not. It's the, this instruction comes from God. To do the law of God is obedience, but to break the law of God is sin. Okay, and this leads us to what Paul calls the law of sin. It's something that we all follow before we came into the faith. This instruction or this law of sin comes from ourselves, or more specifically, it comes from our flesh. It's our flesh's nature that hates the law of God. The law of the flesh or the law of sin leads us to death. And this is what Paul calls, and we looked at in part five, the law of sin and death. And we know Romans 6, uh, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We'll be looking at that in the next part, chapter six. But the law of the spirit tells us that the law of God is truth. It comes in us and it draws us to the truth. And once it is heard, it leads us towards the law of God, the Torah, and away from the law of sin, which is the flesh. And once this leads us to that, it leads us to what Paul calls the law of faith. It's to conform our way of thinking to the word of God. Paul refers to this as becoming a new man in the faith. One adopts the word of God, his Torah, as the authority over our lives. And once we do and we start practicing that, that leads us to what Paul calls the law of righteousness. It's the instruction to live out our faith. It simply means to practice righteousness. It is doing and following God's Torah. Note, anything that we have done that we claim as good because it was found in the law of God counts as nothing until we have faith. There's a reason for this. The main purpose of following the law of God is to bring glory to our creator. If we do anything, for example, those in Judaism, to follow the law of God before we have faith in our creator, it was not for him, but it was for us. Does that make sense? How can doing good be for God when we do not have faith in God? Thus, doing any good is only to serve us by making ourselves feel good about doing good. Do you see how that works? We are to do good or keep God's law to serve God 
not make ourselves feel good. Anyways, these six laws finally leads us to the seventh law mentioned by Paul, the law of Christ. And that's his instruction or Yeshua's example in the faith to follow the law of God. As we mentioned, he was the Torah made flesh and he came to live out exactly what that was. And Paul refers to his living example as the law of Christ. So now let's get back into Romans 3 and we're going to read verse 21 to 31. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Messiah Yeshua for all who believe. For there is no dis distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Messiah Yeshua, whom God put forward as a propitiation. I always have trouble with that word. As a, the price paid by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and a justifier of the one who has faith in Yeshua. Continuing on verse 27. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what principle? By works? No, but by the principle of faith. For we consider a person to be set right apart from Torah observance. Is God the God of the Jewish people only? Is he not only, is he uh, not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since God is one. He will set right the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then nullify the Torah through faithfulness? May it never be. Of course not. On the contrary, we uphold the Torah. So it is through Yeshua's works that we are justified into salvation and we're, and passed over our former sins. Our works do not earn us salvation. Our works are not for, our, for that purpose. They serve another purpose. And Paul will discuss that later. So what we just read here, Paul established several things, three things. One, our obedience is not for salvation, but the result of our faith. We believe the word of God to be true, and that is our faith. Since we believe that the word of God is true, we then do or obey what we believe to be true. It's really that simple. That's what faith is. Paul also states, that God is the God of Gentiles and Jews. This means that God does not have one law for the Jews and one law for the Gentiles. Now, that would be ridiculous. He treats us all as equals and are all afforded the same blessings and freedom of following the same perfect law. We covered this earlier in the series. Now, the third thing from what we just read that Paul mentioned. And most importantly, Paul wants to make it very, very clear that just because our obedience in the faith has nothing to do with our salvation, it does not mean that we do not need to keep the Torah of God. We are to uphold and to obey the law of God. This brings us full circle now, way back 
to what we saw at the beginning in, in Romans chapter one. Paul opened that letter stating that God's grace brings us into the obedience of the faith. You remember? That's what we started with today. And at the end of chapter three, he still brings us back to the same point. So this concludes what I was going to share with you today. And we're just going to look at this, what we saw today. It is by grace, through faith, that we are saved. And grace is designed to bring about the obedience of the faith. Obedience to the Torah. You know, Torah defines sin. And all, everyone, Jews, Gentiles, lost sheep of Israel, everyone will be judged by the Torah. The same law for all. And you know, it's the doers of the Torah that will be justified. That's why faith is counted as righteousness. Circumcision has uh, much value. Um, not to earn our salvation, but as evidence of our salvation. And it is counted as righteousness by God. It's the fruit of our salvation. It proves a circumcised heart has always meant a heart that will be willing and desires to follow the Torah. A circumcised heart is a desire for obedience in the faith. To be under the law, it does not mean those that keep the Torah, but rather it means those that are subject to the effects, i.e. death. The effects of breaking the Torah. It's like being under the influence of alcohol. Right? We're under the effects. So we'd be drunk. We'd be under the influence. It's the same thing, being under the influence of the law, the Torah. That concludes my teaching for today. And uh, I'm going to stop the record and invite you all. Then if you have questions to uh, turn on your and your microphone